what is so appropriate uh, to sing about prayer, because in a moment we're going to turn to prayer, and then the message is going to consider the privilege that we have of prayer, that we have an open line of communication with our Heavenly Father who loves us, that our Creator hears and answers our prayers. And I'd like to call us to prayer with these words from uh, Colossians chapter 4 and the second verse. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to sing songs of praise. We thank you for the opportunity to turn to your word. And Lord, as we pause and think about your word, we're, we're just reminded in wonderful ways that you haven't left us guessing about who you are and what you require of us, that you haven't left us guessing about how to have a right relationship with you. You haven't left us guessing about how to be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life, but you have told us in your holy word. And so, Lord, as we turn to your word, I pray that uh, you would help us through the power of your Holy Spirit to set aside the distractions and the many busy things that are going on and uh, to hear from you and that we would meet with you in your word. Holy Spirit, shine the floodlight on your word and, and meet us where we're at. Challenge us where we need to be challenged and encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And Lord, I thank you for the team that went to challenge from our, our students, high school students. I, I pray that they'd have a wonderful, impactful week in growing in their relationship with you. I pray for safety on the roads as they travel to Kansas City. I pray for uh, the leaders, and I do pray that this would be a week where wonderful things would happen, that you would work powerfully in the lives of all who are there, over 3,000 students uh, from around uh, the Evangelical Free Church. We thank you for this event, and we pray your blessing on it. We thank you that we have the privilege of handing out water bottles uh, and tomorrow in, in the parade. And Lord, we pray that those labels that point to you, uh, that the message uh, challenges, that point to the gospel, that point to your word, would land on good soil, and that hearts would uh, begin uh, the process of searching for you at the prompting of a quick message on a water bottle by a church that cares. Uh, so we pray your blessing on that. Lord, we acknowledge that in this room there are needs uh, for healing. Many, there are, there are griefs, there are sorrows, there are joys. There's all of that. We thank you that you hear us when we cry out to you. We pray that we would be a church and that we would be people who are near to the brokenhearted and that we would encourage uh, those who are uh, uh, need encouragement by pointing to you the hope that we have in you, Lord Jesus. And again, we do now ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak that you would apply your holy word to our hearts. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today uh, we've come to our second week uh, in our new series of messages that I've titled uh, uh, Candid Conversations About Christian Living. That's Candid Conversations About Christian Living. And throughout this series, we're gazing at several vital practices in the lives of believers. Uh, they've been known as spiritual disciplines or spiritual exercises. And we're asking ourselves over and over, how am I doing in pursuing growth uh, in my walk with Jesus? And the word discipline is an appropriate word, uh, but in Greek, it, it carries with it the idea... Uh, the of an intentional or purposeful pursuit of training. Uh, it's related uh, to the concept of like athletic training, like the gymnasium. Uh, in, in the weight room, I'm not a weightlifter, but I know some people who are, it, it takes discipline to build that muscle tone. If you are a runner and like to run a marathon, you don't just wake up one morning and go, you know, I think I'll do that. If you do, you're probably not going to make it very far anyway. It takes discipline and effort and training and exertion uh, to intentionality, if you will, uh, to be ready for uh, that marathon day uh, to then make it the, the, the 26 miles. 
And so I want us, and I'm encouraging us, to ask ourselves over and over again, am I actively and intentionally pursuing my best year yet with Jesus? And, and last week, we considered the place of God's Word, the place of the Bible in our lives. And I'd like to just call our attention again to the words of Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11, and then verse 105. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to, get this, your word. And then it says, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Your commandments, another phrase that's referring to God's word. I have stored up, again, your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then verse 105 of Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. I don't want to share everything I shared last week again, but let's just summarize quickly. We need regular and intentional Bible intake. As Christians, we need to immerse ourselves in God's Word. If we're not taking in God's Word regularly, we are without question spiritually starving. Yes, that's a strong statement, and it's absolutely true. So here's a question uh, for all of us to ask ourselves. Have I taken an intentional and personal step of growth in the area of Bible intake? That's going to be different for each of us. It's going to look different. There's lots of great ways to take in God's Word. I'm not saying one size fits all. It doesn't. But I am saying that we need to be intentional in taking in the Bible. That will look different for each of us. Some, uh, some of us might say, I, I'm not much of a reader, but listening really works well. Other, I mean, there's just lots of ways to do that, lots of plans to do that. But what's important is, am I being intentional in doing that? Have I taken a step of growth? And if you haven't, I'd encourage you to. And if you have, uh, let me just encourage you one weekend. Keep up the good work and keep asking God for strength. Now, this morning, we'll be turning our attention uh, to uh, the discipline, the spiritual discipline or practice of prayer, and we'll be looking at three brief passages in the New Testament regarding prayer, and I'm confident that as we examine the subject of prayer, that we'll find ourselves motivated to experience growth in this area as well as part of, again, intentionally pursuing our best year yet with Jesus. In the Christian life, no discipline is more foundational than Bible intake, and next and second only to Bible intake in importance is prayer. Let's jump into God's Word. If you'd like to follow along, go ahead and turn to James chapter 5 and verse 13. We'll be looking at James 5, 13 to 18. And as I read, listen for the theme or the word prayer. It's repeated over and over again in this passage. Again, that's James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Friends, every situation that we face is a call to prayer. Every situation, all of them, are calls to prayer. Now, obviously, this passage is all about prayer. Did you catch how often this recurring theme in the word prayer itself is mentioned? Uh, The passage is saturated with prayer, and if we look closely, we see that the word occurs in every verse, and a number of different circumstances are mentioned, and all of them serve as profound calls to prayer. Ultimately, every situation we face calls us to prayer. Let's take a look at the circumstances uh, that are mentioned here in which we are called to pray. We're told to pray when we're suffering. That's verse 13, and it begins with a question and then a call to prayer. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him, but by application, him or her would be very appropriate, let him pray. And we should point out that this is not necessarily a prayer for deliverance. 
when suffering hardships, we need to be praying for strength to endure, for the strength to persevere. And sometimes people say perseverance is a Bible word, and I have trouble wrapping my mind around what that means. Let me just give a a quick phrase that helps us understand what perseverance is. It's simply this, keeping on, keeping on. That might be a helpful phrase for some of us as we're thinking about that. Staying the course, perseverance. We ought to pray for that. When we find ourselves longing for relief in suffering, we can certainly and, and should pray for deliverance, but more importantly, we pray for endurance. And for God to accomplish his perfect, his perfect purposes, and we know, probably personally, but certainly biblically, we know that God uses challenges and suffering to grow us spiritually. I say that because the first chapter of James tells us to count it all joy when we face trials of many kinds, as it's widely varied trials, all sorts of difficulty, and because, because God uses trials to grow us and to stretch us and to change us and to grow us spiritually. And so we know that for certain biblically, but I would imagine that many of us know that experientially, that it was in the the moment or the moments when things were hard, when things were not going right, not the way you wanted, that you say, you look back and say, it was at those times that my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ developed roots and went deep. It was in those moments that I declared, I need you, oh how I need you, and I meant it. Now, we certainly ought to cry out to God when we're suffering, and it's not wrong to pray for deliverance. I think of the psalmist, the beginning of Psalm 13 uh, says, uh, the psalmist cries out, how long, O Lord? Uh, So it is certainly right and good uh, to be very honest in prayer, and to praying for deliverance is a fine thing. But even deeper than praying for deliverance is to pray for strength to endure. And for God to accomplish his purposes. But the focus isn't only suffering. We're to pray when we're cheerful or when we're happy. I don't know if you noticed the other half of verse 13. The second half of verse 13 there says, it says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. And singing heartfelt songs of praise is ultimately a type of prayer. Or at least it should be. Our worship music that we sing should be a prayer to God. I certainly hope that as we sang the words, How Great Thou Art, that it expressed the cry of your heart this morning, that that was the prayer of your heart. O oh Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder, when I think of God, His Son not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. You know, just worship through song, it's our prayer. And then there is this extended section on praying when we find ourselves facing sickness or physical illness. Verses 14 to 16 addresses this subject, and we'll spend more time discussing this theme in just a minute. And on top of all of this, I'm not preaching all of James, but if you kind of rolled your eyes back to the very beginning of the book of James, in James uh, chapter 1 and verse 5, uh, we would see that we're to pray when we lack wisdom. Uh, James 1.5 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Now, friends, the default condition right now, due to the information revolution that we have lived through in our lifetime, is drowning in information and starving for wisdom. Uh, that's not the way it was 100 years ago, but it is the way it is now. You can have almost any advanced information at your fingertips on your smartphone at any time. Just Google it. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but I'm just saying that we are drowning in all kinds of information, and we don't have the wisdom to sort it, through, to sort it out. Oh, how we need this today. In a world of constant notifications... All kinds of information coming at us all the time. How do we sift through it all? We need wisdom. When we don't understand what's going on, when we don't know what to do, we ought not to throw our hands in the air and say, I give up. Oh no. Such an experience is a call to prayer. We pray and ask God for wisdom. 
Trusting God, we pray. Can you see the big picture here? The, it, it's obvious. Every situation that we face is a call to prayer. The good, the bad, and even the ugly, they're all calls to prayer. Now, with that in mind, I want to take a closer look at praying when we're facing sickness. I'll read verses 14 to 16 again. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The point is obvious. Prayer for the sick is something that followers of Jesus are called to. This specifically says that when we find ourselves facing sickness, we need to call the elders of the church, which implies that there is more than one elder, by the way, the elders, plural, of the church, and so that they uh, can come, pray over, and anoint us with oil. And honestly, if you think about the last time you were seriously ill, if you've been there, you may This isn't the experience for everybody, but for many people, when they're dealing with serious illness and discouragement that sometimes can be associated with that, we can find it difficult to personally pray at those times. I'm not saying we shouldn't try. We should. But in those situations, we're calling for help. And with that, I'll admit that these verses have sparked quite a bit of discussion and even debate throughout church history, and most of the discussions and debate are focused on the call to anoint with oil. And most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, probably feel at least somewhat hesitant here to do what's called for. And when we avoid doing what God says, we're missing out. It probably, at least in some ways, to some of us, feels unusual and uncomfortable. And you say, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because uh, I've been a pastor for a decade and a half, and I've had wonderful times of praying over and anointing people with oil, but they've been relatively limited. Uh, So I would say that that probably means that we are somewhat hesitant to obey this command, and we should practice it more. But let's take a closer look and think about all of this and do a little bit unpacking. I'm sure that many of us are just honestly wondering, uh, what's the oil all about? And, and this question is a challenge to answer because anointing with oil is not mentioned often in the New, in the New Testament. Only a couple of times, actually. And when Jesus sent his disciples out two by two in Mark chapter 6, specifically Mark 6.13, we know that they anointed with oil. Mark 6.13 says this, and they cast out many demons and anointed uh, with oil, Uh, many who were sick and healed them. But this doesn't tell us why they anointed with oil, just that they did. And in Luke 10, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, a relatively familiar text, uh, text, we would notice that they poured oil and wine on the wounds of the injured man, and that seems to imply some sense of a medicinal value, at least in the context of Luke 10. But again, we're still, we're, we're reading that it was practiced, we're reading that it happened, but we're still wondering. That said, I'm convinced that to understand what anointing with oil is all about, and I understand that this has been debated throughout church history, but to understand what it's all about, we need to go back to the Old Testament. And quickly, here's the big picture on the concept of anointing with oil uh, in the world of the Old Testament. When people were set apart for God, in a special way, they were anointed with oil in the Old Testament. This is true of both kings and priests. And so you can probably think quickly of a number of Old Testament kings, uh, probably greatest, uh, you know, David and Solomon. Do you remember Samuel, fill your horn with oil and go to Jesse, which was David's father, and, uh, you know, one of his sons you will anoint with oil to anoint to be king. You know, we, we hear that, and the priests the same way. Priests were anointed with oil at the beginning of their ministry, and kings were anointed And their anointing was symbolic of their, again, being set apart to and for the Lord. So with that background in mind that would have been clear in the minds of the original audience of James, anointing a sick person with oil and praying for them 
is setting them apart for God's special care. The prayer and anointing with oil says with words and with actions that we're setting this person apart who is ill for God's special care. We're boldly asking for God's special attention and his care. Anointing with oil is powerful. It's a powerful and special symbol that points directly to this. There's nothing magical about it. Don't misunderstand that. There's nothing magical here. And it's God who does the healing, not the oil. Verse 15 says that specifically. It says, and the Lord will raise him up. And if you're looking at verse 15, you'll see, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And I quickly mention that there's a little bit of a hint of a double meaning here in Greek that's hard to see in English. The word save is the Greek word sozo, which talks about healing and is used that way in the New Testament, but is also the word that refers to salvation. And so it, it seems that there is a bit of a double meaning that's pointing to both physical and spiritual healing. And that isn't all that surprising because we see that the two were often wrapped around one another, even in Jesus' earthly ministry. Think of Mark chapter 2 with a paralytic, right? And I'm going to remember, and uh, obviously he needed healing. He needed to be able to walk because he was unable to walk. But how does Jesus begin that uh, discussion with a paralytic as he is about to heal him? He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And you're saying, well, that's not really what this was about, right? You know, and then he says, rise, pick up your mat, and walk. So they were, they were wrapped around one another. They were related. And it appears that the same is the case here in verse 15. Now, I would just generally say that I have been surprised over the years by how little we actually do this. Maybe it's that it feels a little bit intimidating uh, to ask for. But we should obey and live out this command, I think, more than we do. We do, and it's been a very special time. And I can say that because I've been one of the elders. And I'd say we should do it more. It should be requested more. Now, we're also told here, and this is amazing, that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And that is obviously wonderful news. Just pause and think about it for a minute. God hears our prayers and works in incredibly powerful ways. Now, uh, my understanding is Al Thunberg's Sunday School class was talking about uh, prayer and trying to wrap uh, their, their uh, minds theologically around prayer, and that may cause, uh, I'd love to talk about the doctrine of prayer, but that may cause our brains to overheat a little bit because we're finite, and, and that's good. Pondering the things of the Lord should blow our minds. That's a good thing. But hear this, God hears our prayers and works in incredibly powerful ways. Can we wrap our minds around all of that? Well, no, and that's okay, but we know it's true. A quick look at verses 17 and 18 calls to mind the prophet Elijah in his prayers about the rain, which prove just this point. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and get this, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. This is an encouraging picture of the truth that was stated just before in verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Uh, that's an earthquake, isn't it? The New, the New International Version translates it this way. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. But there's a roadblock here for a lot of us. And that's why I said this is candid conversation, so I want to be candid. There's a roadblock here for a lot of us. We're afraid that our prayers will not be effective. And at times, the fear of ineffective prayer cripples us. And it provides us an excuse for not asking boldly in prayer. And these feelings and fears are real. And they can indeed be crippling keeping us from obeying what's called for here. 
I'd imagine that most of us, if we're very honest, have faced the difficult experience of praying for someone, or perhaps a circumstance, something, but for someone to be healed, and they didn't get well. Perhaps they died. You've had the experience of of asking for something good, and it didn't happen that way. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure that if you are a prayer warrior, that you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you know the sting of it. And such experiences can send us spinning. Again, this is candid conversations about Christian living. I will lead us out of the weeds with God's word, but I want to be honest about the weeds we sometimes get stuck in. And such experiences should le- uh, can leave us wondering. I'm not saying they should leave us wondering these things, but they certainly can. How should I think about this experience? Should I give up? Is my faith too small? Hard questions that many of us have struggled with very, very personally. And such hard questions can be confusing and disorienting and even discouraging. And this passage tells us that we should pray for healing and we ought to obey that. We should pray for healing, but how do we think about all of this? Well, one thing I would suggest is we must also understand that God doesn't always answer the way we personally desire, or at least according to our preferred timetable. We ask boldly. We are called to do that. But we must understand that as we trust God and surrender to him in prayer and surrender to his will in prayer, that as we do this, we ask boldly, but we also understand that God doesn't always answer the way we personally desire and certainly not always according to our preferred timetable. If you ask for healing and and someone passes, if they're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, friends, there is eventual healing in heaven as well. One example of that. And if you're saying, well, I know that's true, but I am still, I am churning, and I wish you hadn't brought this up because this is a real hang-up for me, and I, I've been spinning here before. If you are struggling here, you are in good company. The Apostle Paul faced a similar kind of experience and struggle. Yeah, the Apostle Paul, who, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote about half the New Testament, faced a similar kind of experience where he asked, and the answer wasn't what he hoped for. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me, be, be, uh, to keep me uh, from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. You see, Paul asked repeatedly and boldly three times, I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my, of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, we don't exa- uh, he faced this thorn. We don't know exactly for sure what it was. We do know that Paul pleaded with God to take it away, and God didn't. Some suggest, and I think plausibly, uh, that it could have been his eye uh, associated with his eyes or his vision uh, because of some other hints in uh, other New Testament letters where Paul mentions, uh, you would have given me your eye. You know, in Galatians, he mentions his eyes and, and saying that they would have given him their eyes, you know, kind of a situation, or uh, uh, at another uh, situation where there was uh, uh, see with what, with what large letters I'm writing to you, you know, it w- that would it seem to be consistent with a vision issue that perhaps he grabbed the pen and he's writing big because he can't see. We don't know that for sure. We do know whatever it was, it was a thorn and it was a major irritation. It was a major problem. It was a real difficulty. And again, some scholars think it could be associated with his eyes and vision. That may well be. But whatever it was, he pleaded with God to take it away. And what was the answer? Not now. 
So if you're struggling with this kind of experience, I hope that looking at Paul and saying, yeah, Paul, who wrote half the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, had the same experience. Don't be discouraged. Don't let it send you spinning. Realize that God's ways are not our ways. He knows everything, and we don't. His purposes, we don't see sometimes. Sometimes we do, but a lot of times we don't. Here's my understanding. Praying in faith, that's faith in God, not faith in faith, by the way. Faith in God, by nature, implies an ultimate surrender to God's will. God is God, and we are not. God knows everything, and we don't. We are to fervently pray, and yet we realize that our will and God's will is not always the same, and we need to surrender our will to His. When they don't align, and again, our will and His will doesn't always align, when they don't align, it's ours that needs to bend to His. This shouldn't be an excuse to avoid boldly asking in prayer. These verses clearly tell us that we should do that we should. But we must realize that if we're asking for something that that is not God's will, He will sort it out and His will will be done. That said, I'm convinced that God is delighted that His children are coming to Him in prayer. Now, before we move on, we need to take a quick look at the mention of, con- of sins and confession in verses 15 and 16. It's certainly true that confessing sin and receiving accountability and encouragement from fellow Christian friends helps us to experience victory over sin. But it also appears that what's discussed here uh, is specifically sin related to the sickness. Now, please understand, not all sickness is the direct result of our sin. Sickness in general is a result of living in a fallen world, but not all sickness is connected with a specific sin, and to assume such a correspondence is cruel and in some cases spiritually abusive. Think of Job and the Old Testament book that bears his name. Job suffered incredibly, and his suffering was not the result of his sin. It's very, very clear. Or in John chapter 9, Jesus ministered to a man born born blind. And his disciples asked him a question. Uh, They asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Can you hear the cruel and even, honestly, spiritually abusive assumption that's associated with this? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's cruel. It's mean. You hear the assumption? And it's a wrong assumption. And Jesus responds, neither this man nor his parents sinned. For this happened that the works of God might be displayed in his life. You see, Here's the reality, is that often we don't understand how God is working for his ultimate glory. He always works for his glory. He does what will bring him the most glory, and he should. That's who he is. But we don't see how that will work. So this man was born blind, and why was he born blind? So God got glory. But did did the man born blind understand that? Well, not until afterwards. Not until after he was healed, he, he suffered a long time. And so this is, um, that said, it is also very clear, though uncomfortable, that sometimes sickness and sin are closely connected. You say, where are you going with that? Well, this would obviously be the case with alcohol and drug abuse. There can be major medical conditions that result from such a abuse of substances, right? And is that the result of a specific sin? I mean that tactfully, but I think none of us would disagree. In many cases, STDs, that's the way it works. The specific, not in every case, but in many cases, there was sin involved that led very directly to the suffering. And in such situations, confession of sin is essential because the issue here is not just physical sickness, but spiritual sickness as well. You follow what I'm saying? Like, it would make sense if someone is praying for healing from a physical 
challenge associated with the abuse of illegal drugs, it would be right for us to pray for healing. It would be also right for them to confess the sin that led to the condition, right? It would be fitting. Now, we've got to be careful. Is that the case in some situations? Yes. Some people want to deny that because it makes them uncomfortable. The other error is to go over, and it's probably common, is to say that all sickness and suffering is correlated with someone's specific sin. That is wrong, and we must not go there. We, we can say that that is possible, but not always the case. Uh, we have to remember J- Jesus' words in John 9, neither this man nor his parents sinned, yet he was born blind, or the example of Job. Now let's uh, ponder the motivating phrase found at the end of verse 16. If you'd like to underline in your Bible, this would be one place uh, to do that. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working, or in the New, Ner- New International Version, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That's really an earthquake. If you think about it, God hears our prayers and he answers. And this should motivate us to pray. We should desire to be in communication with God. Think about it. Our creator loves to hear from his children. We have an open line of communication with our creator. It is nothing short of incredible. We should desire to take steps of growth in our prayer lives when we ponder what we have in prayer. Yes, prayer is a vital discipline in pursuing our best year yet with Jesus, but we don't need to be guilted into praying more. No, we need to think about what we have in prayer, and we will want to. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We have an open line of communication with our Creator. Just saying that makes me want to pray. Now I want to turn to just a couple of quick passages, shorter passages. Uh, First, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. So we try to put all of this together. Hear this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You hear joy and giving thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will. And here in this passage, we see as followers of Jesus, we're called to pray continually. I'd uh, underline and memorize verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing in the English Standard Version. The New International Version, pray continually. The New Living Translation, a little bit more of a paraphrase, never stop praying. The Christian life is to be characterized by prayer. And I understand this to be speaking of an attitude of prayer. This is not saying that we can't focus on things other than prayer. We need to allow ourselves to concentrate on many different things. If you are undergoing surgery, you want your surgeon to concentrate. If you're using power tools, you need to watch what you're doing. We concentrate on many necessary things, but prayer should always be right there. Never forgotten or set aside. We should be praying all the time and always returning to prayer throughout the day with all kinds of prayers and requests. Colossians 4.2 says it this way, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Prayer is a continuing relationship. And as followers of Jesus, we're called to pray without ceasing or continually. And this command reminds me of the room that I have for growth in the area of prayer. And I would imagine that for many of us, hearing those words, pray continually, pray without ceasing, reminds us of the room that we have for growth. One more passage I want to look at quickly. This is uh, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'd encourage all of us also to underline or mark down uh, these words as well, and maybe even to commit them to memory. I've summarized what this calls for by saying this. We're called to pray about everything all the time. We're called to pray about everything all the time. A prayerful dependence on God is the key to peace, to freedom from anxiety. 
If we want to experience God's perfect peace, if we want freedom from anxiety, we need to bring everything to Him in prayer. And it's been well said that anxiety and prayer are great and opposing forces in the Christian life. Anxiety, friends, drives out prayer, and prayer drives out anxiety. In prayer, we trust in God. We trust that God is sovereign, He's in control, and that He's loving. And in prayer, and in prayer we entrust everything to Him. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Ponder that. God is sovereign. He's in control. And he's loving. That give, Then surrender everything to him in prayer. W- let's strive to live this, to bring everything to God in prayer. Well, we've covered a lot of ground this morning. And we've seen that prayer is vital to pursuing our best year yet with Jesus. We've been called to to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, pray without ceasing. We've been told, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Ultimately, every situation that we face is a call to prayer, and we're to pray continually. We have an open line of communication in our relationship with God. And a prayerful dependence on God is the key to experiencing God's perfect peace, freedom from anxiety. And I'm confident that every one of us in this room can see that we have room to grow in this area of prayer. And with that in mind, you might be sitting here saying, well, what should I do? And the answer is simple. Start praying. We can talk about prayer and even read about prayer, all of which can be helpful, but it doesn't always produce growth in prayer. If you want to learn to play a musical instrument, you're eventually going to have to spend time with the instrument, right? Uh, You can't just read books about the instrument. They're certainly helpful, but they will not teach you to play like picking up the instrument and practicing. Prayer is like this in many ways. We learn to pray And grow in prayer by doing what? By praying. Books on prayer are helpful. They've been tremendously helpful to me. But reading about prayer is not a substitute for actually praying. If you want to read a book on the spiritual disciplines, I'd recommend Don Whitney's book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. It is the best book on the subject. If you read one book this year, I would say that would be a good one to read, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Don Whitney. But again, We don't want to just learn about the disciplines. We want to practice them, and that means putting them into practice, not just talking about them. With that in mind, here are a few practical suggestions as we close to overcome some common roadblocks as we seek to grow. Sometimes we say to ourselves, I can't seem to find time to pray. And closely connected with that roadblock, I'm just too busy. And I think some of it's because of the information revolution. We're so, so, we're so bombarded with so many pieces of urgent information today. I suggest making time. And don't make, your prayer, don't make your prayer goal and your time goal unattainable at first. Start small. Set aside a few minutes. I've often said that five, is five, five minutes is five more than nothing. Uh, Believe me, I'm not suggesting mediocrity, but rather appreciating small victories. You're saying, where do I start? How do I put feet on this? Set aside three to five minutes consistently. We all can find that. And that is three to five more than nothing. That's a huge victory. And and, and it ought to be celebrated. If you are feeling uh, frustrated in your thinking, saying, I get so distracted. Uh, I've been here, so if you've been, this is... This is probably a roadblock for me, so uh, maybe, maybe you can experience, you've experienced this too. And then when you, get, you, you say, I get so distracted, and then you find yourself additionally frustrated because you're frustrated with being frustrated and, you're distra- and distracted, and you're frustrated about being distracted. Um, I remember the council, uh, I, I read this council uh, years and years ago, and it was a simple suggestion that was so helpful to me. When we realize that our mind is wandering and we're distracted, 
Don't let that send you spinning. Just say, God, I thank you for bringing me back. Just in prayer, God, I thank you for bringing me back. Don't let that get frustration and then frustration with being frustrated and all of that. And that'll take you all, all kinds of distraction. God, thank you for bringing me back. Thank you for bringing it to my attention that my mind was wandering. And then proceed. If you feel like I don't know what to pray about, allow your times of Bible intake to lead you into prayer. And I'd also point out that the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 9 to 13 is intended to be an outline or trailheads. Each line is a trailhead for different categories of prayer. Uh, so I often walk through the Lord's Prayer and allow that to be trailheads. Um, there's a, an acronym. It's actually in the Bible instruction book. It's been handed around all over the place. Uh, we talked about it in uh, the junior high Sunday school class, Bible instruction. But ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. And I think that we tend, uh, or at least often, uh, skip over the ACT part, Adoration, Confession, and Thanksgiving, and go right to supplication where we ask and make requests. So sometimes that outline I is a helpful reminder. Well, there's a lot of Thanksgiving to be done, too, isn't there? A lot of adoring God for who He is. Confessing sin that the Holy Spirit brings to mind. But maybe if you say, I'll run out of things to pray about. Pause. Rejoice always, give thanks in all circumstances. Pause with some thanksgiving. That should take some time. If you're saying, I don't know what words to use, talk to God. Just talk to him. Friends, every situation we face is a call to prayer. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for this challenge. And I pray that as we pause and ponder prayer, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would be enabled and motivated to be more and more people of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you hear and answer our prayers. And it's in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we pray these things. Amen. We're just